What's up, everyone? I'm Owen Poindexter, senior writer with Front Office Sports. I'm so excited to be bringing our new podcast, The Newsroom, to you. We are writing and talking to people every day in the world of sports and how it affects business and culture. And we're digesting all this stuff and putting it out in our, our daily newsletters, which we put out twice a day on our website, frontofficesports.com. But what we don't have until now is a way to really bring this in terms of more of a conversation because we're talking about this stuff with each other all the time about what this these issues mean long term how these stories are going to play out you know the the history of all this stuff we do get to that sometimes in our coverage but this is our chance to really sit back and, and chat about it and bring you into the conversation as well so i'm super excited to bring you in for this inaugural episode we're talking about live golf the saudi arabia backed golf league that has taken the golf world by storm and really changed the whole picture of a sport that's been around for the longest time. And if you turn on daytime television, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you're, you're going to find golf mixed in there. And it's been kind of the same product for so long. All of a sudden that's changing really quickly due to billions of dollars being thrown around by a sovereign nation that you know, maybe eventually it's going to be in it for the money, but it also has some other reasons that it's doing this. So we're going to break that down in just a sec. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business, especially in today's economy. But over 31,000 businesses do know their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, planning, budgeting, and inventory, so you can manage risk and improve margins, everything you need all in one place. See why NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash the newsroom. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. All right, now let's get to it. So, very excited to be talking with our senior writer, Mike McCarthy. How's it going, Mike? Good, Owen. Glad to be here. And our writer, Doug Greenberg. How's it going? I am doing so good, Owen. I'm really happy to be here as well. So... We've been hearing about Live Golf. It's been this specter in the golf world and the sports world for feels like over a year now. But yeah. now we're finally seeing it in action. So you have both actually been to Live Golf tournaments, and I'm really excited to get your take and just get the deal with with what this thing is. So and it's very unlike if you watch the PGA Tour, which is basically any golf you can watch up until the beginning of Live Golf. You, you know what to expect. You know, there's you see your golfers, they take their shots. You know, there's they're very polite clapping, maybe some whoops if there's like a really big moment. Live golf is different. So, Doug, you were in Boston a couple weekends ago. Set the scene for us. What's this tournament like? Yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, not to harp on their whatever it is, their their slogan, but uh, they say it's golf but louder, and that's definitely true. Uh, you know, you go there, there are. Uh, there's music playing at the tees of a lot of holes, uh, even throughout the holes, um, which is really interesting too. Because uh, you know, I asked we asked some of the players about it, about how they felt, and um, the most notable answer I thought came from Taylor Gooch, and he said, "Man, I wish there was there was music on every hole." Um, you know, it's it's the kind of thing where it's it definitely creates that sort of like party like atmosphere. Um, you know, when I was at the tournament, I was on the 18th green uh, on Sunday, and Greg Norman was throwing beers to spectators uh, mm. from from Club 54. Um, you know, they have hype men, like, throughout, like, announcing on the speakers. They have uh, the the podium ceremonies, which are a lot like Formula One, um, you know, are super crazy. Uh, Diplo played a concert <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> and actually, they just announced uh, that Jason Derulo is going to be playing uh, at the Chicago tournament. So yeah, it's you know they're they're clearly trying to go for this this kind of like more lively atmosphere and kind of liven up that that's quote unquote like stuffy uh, country club atmosphere that golf's been become, become kind of accustomed to. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds pretty different. I mean, definitely from golf, but really from like any sport. Like, can you imagine like you're at a baseball game and like I don't even know who would be like the guy like Rob Manfred's like throwing beers into the crowd. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Mike, is that your experience too? You were in Portland a couple months ago, so or a month ago. Um, yeah, does that all check out for you, or is it a little different? Yeah, actually, I was in Bedminster uh, at oh, the sorry. former President's Golf Club, and really, what it is, Owen, it's the waste management, openization of golf. 
Uh, if you've ever seen the Waste Management Open, it's the rowdiest spot on the PGA Tour. They've got this one hole, the 16th hole, where it's like, you know, Thunderdome, where everybody's cheering and everybody's drunk and it's getting a hole and this, that, and the other thing. And that's what they're trying to do. They, they're trying to make uh, a staid, boring golf event into kind of a, uh, a Formula One race with a winner's podium and as doug said the concerts and the, the booze and the champagne so uh it, it's a completely different uh approach than the pga tour here's my question though for you doug uh does it work you know i mean i know live is going for this young crowd but the old, rich, white shoe country club crowd likes their golf a certain way. They don't want to hear get in the hole. They don't want to see people on their cell phones. They like it boring. They like it slow. So I'm wondering if this is a little bit of a step too far. You know, uh, I think like time time's going to have to tell on that one. Uh, for the record, you know, we had you, you were mentioned the get in the hole guys. I had some mashed potatoes guys on the front on the <laughs> uh, on the tee which I was happy to see some mashed potatoes guys in real life. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, but but really, time's going to tell. You know, I uh, I wrote up the Saturday feature last week on my experience at the tournament, and I got to talk to um, Atua Kosla, who goes by AK, uh, president of the of the league. And basically, the, the two things he, st- he said that, t- that stuck out to me were, one that this is they're seeing this as like a beta year like they just want to get this out there they want to they want to see what it's like they want to make sure that people see that this product is real um and the other thing he said that really stuck out was that you know if you go to uh, an nfl game if you go to an nba game you go to any other sporting event um especially in the nfl you know in the nfl there's only like what uh uh like not that much playing time that actually happens, like how, how much uh, action actually happens on the field and everything else that happens around it is just entertainment, right? Um, so there's a lot of time that they need to fill and, you know, they've already shortened it with the shotgun starts uh, mm-hmm. in golf and now they're just trying to fill in everything that's not golf with all this other stuff. And and yeah. again, time's going to tell to see if that actually works. Yeah, and to tell you the truth, Owen, I, I think that it's one of the most appealing things about it. A golf tournament takes a long time. It takes a long time to watch every top golfer tee off at number one and go through 18. So if you have a tournament that's 54 holes in three days instead of 72 holes in four days, that gives you another day to go watch something else or go enjoy yourself and your family and your kids. Uh, number two, to Doug's point, the shotgun start, uh, the rounds only take three or four hours as opposed to five or six or even seven hours. So you can go to the course in person, you know what I mean, have fun and not literally spend eight hours, nine hours on the course on your feet. Yeah, right. I, I don't have eight hours to spend on, on anything, let alone no. like standing on <laughs> waiting for someone to, to golf. The NBA is an interesting comparison. Like, I, I live in the Bay Area. I'll make it to a Warriors game every once in a while. That's that's a party. I mean, it's oh, yeah. you know, like 48 minutes of actual basketball. But just like you feel like you're just in a huge crowd with everyone having a great time. There's light shows, just like music. Uh, you know, there's DJs, there's dancers. And it's a lot of fun. And you're like, oh, yeah, there's a basketball game here, too. So interesting that, uh, yeah, Liv's taking that approach. Uh, and, of course, uh, the PGA Tour is trying to strike back with its, like, kind of short form, relatively thing with uh, Tiger Woods and Roy McIlroy announced their new league. It's going to start um, not this year. I think maybe not even next year. Sorry. I want to say it's um, ja- I think it's January 2024. If I'm and that's what it, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, where that's short, it's in a stadium. It and they're going for this more like entertainment product where it's more like you know an NBA game, NFL game, where it's not your whole day, and it's more exciting. It, it seems like it's going to have some almost like Top Golf esque features where it'll be like virtual. You very much. Uh, yeah, golf. Yeah, they're going to be, be hit. hitting. They're going to be hitting into a giant screen. And then there will be a, a green area where it'll be, again, you know, an NBA-like crowd surrounding them, you know, cheering and screaming while they chip and putt and hole out. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the the reaction of the PGA Tour has been very interesting. They went from completely dismissing Live Golf and refusing to have any talks with them to regarding them as an existential threat to now 
copying, in fact, a lot of the things that Libby's Gulp is doing about trying to make the game faster and flashier. So, yeah, I mean, uh, they've sort of hit all the buckets in trying to combat Live Golf, but I have a feeling that Live Golf is not going anywhere. I mean, I, I tell you, one of the impressions of my I had when Doug was covering it, and I got this a lot from Doug's feature story, is Live feels like they've turned the corner. Now the questions at their tournaments are about the tournament and how are you playing and who's going to win and who's going to lose, not the you know inevitable questions about the Saudi backing and morality and all that. So, I mean, in Doug's story, Liv felt like they turned a corner, and I believe that's absolutely true. Yeah, and I feel like that's going to be... That, that's where they're, they're going to get. I saw an op-ed a little while ago saying, you know, like, this whole thing's not working for Saudi Arabia. Like, every story you read is, is mentioning their human rights issues and all this stuff and protesters. And that's true right now. But, yeah, what about a year or two from now? Are we still going to be... Is that still going to be part of it? Like maybe if the protests stay a part of it, maybe if that presence is still there. But th then you get into all this stuff where it's like, well, if we're gonna like rag on Live Golf, don't we have to then talk about you know like Newcastle is also owned by the the uh, public investment fund, which is who's funding Live Golf, a and it, there is kind of this like you know how, how do we cover this going forward but i think it is going to be more and more about the golf especially because they have so many big name golfers mm -hmm. yeah i mean they they've got a lot of stars and you you're right uh the 99,000 dollar question here though is we don't know what the saudis are going to do 2 years from now i mean they could declare live golf this huge success well you know what they could pull the plug Sure. And then these 50, 60 guys are out there floating in space as the most laughable duds in world golf, uh, facing a lifetime ban from the PGA Tour and no sponsors. So if my advice to them uh, right now is get your money up front because there's no guarantee the Saudis are going to be around in two years. I mean, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But they're a sovereign country. You know what I mean? This isn't some guarantee that they're going to be around. Yeah, yeah, and the the money part of it. I mean, obviously, the the, the money is always it's why why anyone's doing anything really um, in in sports or media or you know it all comes back or to life. that. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I remember I've explained to my kid like you know like your your teacher gets gets paid for what she does, and he's like, oh, oh really? Like she's making money. Um, he's young, um, but um, it, it is. I feel like more present in this than in most sports watching sports intake experiences because like let's go with to, to phil mickelson he's kind of getting everything he wanted right the pga tour is is paying more money they're uh they're getting more money out to their the younger players especially but just to to their players they're adjusting they're changing um you know they're not a monopoly anymore and they're they're making changes and if you look at his interviews uh before all this started that's kind of what he was getting at but he's also getting two hundred million dollars, yeah. so I, I would say a lot of things and and convince myself of a lot of things if I was getting two hundred million dollars. <laughs> so I just feel like in all this and on the PGA Tour, it's the same thing where uh, you know they're talking about how live golf is this this like terrible thing that like they're not even in it for the money. They're you know they're in it for sports washing and all these people are are breaking the their pact their tradition, um, but they're losing a lot of money theoretically. Um, well, we'll see how it all shakes out. We, you know, time will tell, I guess. But um, everyone's, you know, saying one thing, but also there are hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. Um, and Doug, I know that some of the players finally started to acknowledge this when, when you were in Boston. So did that feel like a relief or was it just like, well, duh? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it was like it was like a weight was lifted, right? Like, everyone has been wondering, like, why won't these guys just talk about it? Like, like everyone keeps asking him, and everyone's like, no, no, I came over because, uh, you know, we get more time off, and because I don't have to play every week, and I get the guarantee. And they, they, you know, they would say things like, I don't have to worry about, like, missing the cut and not making money. And these are all valid reasons, and I, and I believe them, you know. I think Matt Wolf was, like, my favorite example. Like, he... His introductory press conference, he looked so happy to be there, and I don't think it was because of the money. I think it was because it was just a new start for him. Um, but yeah, when I was in Boston, you know, we can we can thank Harold Varner because uh, Harold Varner was really the first one to come out and talk about it. Um, 
he, you know, posted on Instagram announcing his he was leaving for live and he said, I'm going to be real. It's about the money. Of course it is. Like, this is it's a business decision. This is setting me up with, you know, what the, the money he was basically what he was saying was the money he was making on the PGA Tour was great. And he was very appreciative for the money he made on the tour. But the kind of money he's getting at live, not just for the guaranteed money that he's getting, but also the prize money, which is obviously immense. Um, it sets him up for generational wealth, wealth and. I think that um, that kind of like broke the ice on the whole thing. And then at the press conference, the introductory press conferences for Varner, Bubba Watson even acknowledged it. Um, Cam Smith, who was notoriously noncommittal when he was asked about it after the Open. Um, you know, they all talked about it and they all said, yeah, like it was a business decision. Like, of course it was. Um, how could you like it's almost I think it was almost like I think spectators were starting to get fed up with being like don't treat us like we're dumb like we know like we're not dumb like it is of course it's about the money especially when there's that much money at stake so i think for the players to finally be talking about it like is sort of a relief for a lot of people and yeah like it, it gets people to start focusing on the golf instead yeah and obviously it comes back to where the money's coming from like if yeah. a rival basketball league popped up and somehow they were just they found a way to make huge profits and they were just passing it all to the players and LeBron James could make a hundred million dollars there. And he did be like, well, okay, like I get it. He's still, he's loaded, but he can be even more loaded now. Uh, but because it's, it's oil money, it's money with human rights issues attached. It's money that has a very fraught relationship with the United States. Um, it, it's a little awkward, but again, obviously if someone yeah. dangles a hundred million dollar check in front of you, that's just going to make a difference, even if you're already yeah. doing fine. Oh, and if I if I could expand on that point, I mean, you know, I uh, I heard a saying once that I think really wor works in this case, which is always tell the truth. It's the easiest thing to remember. And I think these golfers could have avoided a lot of embarrassment and a lot of bad interviews by just simply telling the truth. I'm joining for the money. They asked Charles Barkley about joining Liv. He said, you give me two hundred million dollars, I'll kill a relative. <laughs> you know, and we all had a great laugh, you know, because it was honest, you know, to, to Doug's point, you know, these guys are fooling themselves and trying to fool the public with all these half ass bullshit excuses about why they're doing it. And as soon as they came around and said, you know what, I'm doing it for the money. I'm doing it so I can, you know, retire in 10 years to an island somewhere and my wife and I never have to work a, another day in our life. Then I think, you know what I mean? The public said, you know, what? true, because if I was in that situation, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah. I want to get into, um, kind of, again, what this is going to look like long term, the legitimacy, the legitimacy question. Um, and around that, I think the big question is, are they going to get a U.S. media deal? Because if you start seeing Live Golf on CBS or NBC, it's just going to feel like another golf tournament in a lot of ways. So, Mike, you're a media guy. What are you feeling here? Is it going to happen? Definitely. They, they will have a media deal, uh, I believe, by this time next year. I think you could book it. Uh, there's such a demand for live sports rights. They are truly, you know what I mean, the, the foundation block that's holding up the entire Jenga of uh, the TV industry. Without live sports, the whole thing would just collapse. And uh, I've, also, I've already heard that Fox Sports uh, is interested in uh, Live Golf, which is interesting because Fox fired Greg Norman three or four years ago as its lead golf analyst when he swallowed the mic on the 18th hole at the U.S. Open during their short-lived career of broadcasting the Open. But, you know, business is business, and uh, Greg is Australian, and the Murdochs are Australian, and he just has a very good relationship with the Murdochs. And the other reason why, Owen, I, I'm so confident about them finding a media deal is they've truly done something amazing in golf, which is they've lowered the age of the viewing audience. Uh, networks love golf because it's a very rich audience, right? They're old, but they all drive Mercedes and Volvos and BMWs, and you know they live in Westchester or whatever. Uh, what they've done is they've managed to get 20, 30, 40 year olds to watch golf. Uh, and that has been something that the other networks haven't been able to do. And so far, their statistics on that are very promising. And I think that is going to be the selling card. When they go to Madison Avenue and they go to Fox or they go to the Zone or they go to the other networks, they're going to say, look, we've done something that they haven't done in 30 years. And I think it'll work. 
Yeah, and, and I'm just going to jump in and uh, agree with that. I mean, it's it's going to happen eventually. You know, the, everyone who I've talked to um, around the around the league, um, you know, whether it was AK, the president, he was basically, like I said, he said this was a beta year. They weren't really concerned about getting a TV deal. I mean, they could say whatever they want. You know, I've heard some chatter that maybe there was a couple TV partners that weren't all in on them to start off with. Um, I think now, though, they've they've built up enough of proof of concept to show that this is real and show and now they've built up enough talent to show that it's real um, and that they can attract like a, a big audience from it. Um, so I think it's I think it's inevitable. Like, I think they're going to get this deal eventually. Uh, the other thing that I think that's going to legitimize uh, this whole thing in a lot of people's minds is if and when they get uh, official world golf ranking points which that is another humongous sticking point. And that one is less sure. We really don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but if they're able to get the ranking points, that's also going to be a humongous uh, step in in the way of getting legitimacy. Yeah. yeah I and mean, can you just go ahead and so talk us through that whole, the, the world golf ranking points. Like, well, what does well, that mean? Oh, oh and it's, you know, uh, Doug is putting his finger on something that's very important. World golf ranking points help you qualify for the majors. Uh, the four golf majors are what everybody wants to win. It's what Tiger grew up uh, dreaming to play and win. It's what Nicholas grew up dreaming to play. So if they don't have world golf ranking points, it's going to be much more difficult for live golfers to qualify for the U.S. Open, the U.S. Open, the British Open, and the PGA Championship. Then those guys are going to have a real choice to make. Because if you grew up your whole life winning, wanting to win a major, wanting to win a green jacket, and now because you're playing for Live Golf, you're not allowed, the organizing body said you were banned, that is going to be a real sacrifice. And that's where the rubber is going to hit the road. Mm-hmm. And, and, just from, and just from the perspective of the majors, the, like, you know, obviously the players have been suspended from the PGA Tour. They haven't been suspended from the majors yet, and the majors are completely independent of the PGA Tour. Even the PGA Championship is is independent of the PGA Tour. So as and in my mind, there's no reason why they would ever ban the players because um, it's great television for them, right? Like it's the only time the PGA and the Live players would be playing together. But yes, to Mike's point, the the World Golf ranking points are very very important. Like except for the guys who have already won these tournaments before, um, yeah. who have the exemptions. But yeah, uh- like if yeah. I'll give, right. I'll give you a good reason, Doug. I mean, I agree with Doug that if I was running the majors from business standpoint, I would think of this as manna from heaven, a huge yeah, business amazing. opportunity. Because I could go out there and say, you know what? I have the only tournament where you could see the best in the PGA Tour compete against the best in the Live Golf. These two feeding camps, feuding camps, are going to come together and do the Super Bowl at the Masters. However... You have to uh, talk about the personalities here. Live Golf just filed a lawsuit against the PGA Tour. And in it, they made some very strong allegations against Augusta National Golf Club, uh, for Augusta National supporting the PGA Tour and trying and taking their side over uh, Live Golf. As we all know, Augusta National has the memory of an elephant. Uh, they tend to be vengeful uh, and petty. And they tend to do things the way they want to do them. So if the Augusta National Golf Club turns around and says, hey, Bubba Watson, we don't care if you won two green jackets. You can't uh, play in the Masters anymore. That's tough luck for Bubba. Yeah. All right. This is all great stuff. Let's get some concluding thoughts here or looks to the future. Let's look ahead, you know, one, two, five years. What are we going to see for Live Golf? What do you think? Uh, Doug, I'll start with you. Man, it is so hard to, it's really so hard to say, Um, you know, as we kind of touched on earlier, I think that the surest sign that what Live Golf is doing is working is that the PGA Tour responded so swiftly and they, I mean, it took them a couple tournaments, but the fact that they changed their entire structure, they changed, like they changed the pay structure, they came out with the TGL, um, it shows that they're feeling the heat and it shows in really it, it kind of legitimized what Liv is doing and even s- suspending the players there's a legitimacy um in what Liv is doing right now right so i you know i really don't know how this is going to shake out all i know is that i in my opinion live golf is for real um you know what what ak also told me was that he believes that there's enough space in the market for two professional golf uh you know entities and i actually don't disagree with that because 
Liv is taking a much more global focus than the PGA Tour is. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna announce their their new schedule um, by the end of the season, and I think there's gonna there's gonna be a ton of international locations on there. Um, Australia is pretty much a lock at this point, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more in Europe and things like that. And that's a market that the PGA Tour doesn't have. So they'll have the United States, they'll have international, and I think that's you know it's all. It's all good, and I, you know, this this feud could really go on for years, or they could bury the hatchet at a certain point and just coexist, which I, I think could totally happen. And then they just meet at the majors, and I think that's ultimately great for golf. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to enjoy being in the middle of the drama, uh, <laughs> reporting on it. <laughs> One of my my colleague, uh, if he's listening, my colleague Justin Birnbaum, who works at Forbes, uh, he also went to a couple of these events, and he basically said, uh, "You're living inside of a thirty for thirty right now. Enjoy it." So <laughs> that's definitely what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, Mike, any, any final thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, right now we're going through the Hatfield and McCoy stage. You know what I mean? A lot of this is personal. Uh, Mickelson had you know grudges against the tour going back 20 years. Ditto for Greg Norman. But I think as a sports historian that uh, leagues, dueling leagues, eventually get beyond the Hatfields and McCoys and... Find a way to coexist, if not merge. Uh, don't forget, there was once an NBA and an ABA. There was once an NFL and an AFL. And the NFL and the AFL were enemies to the knife, competing over draft picks and everything else. And all of a sudden, you know what I mean, they found a way to play a, you know, a little game called the Super Bowl against each other. And, you know, next thing you know, they were all one big happy family. So I, I agree with Doug, I think, that in the end, business sense will win out over these personal feuds. There's a lot of golf and a lot of money out there for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'm with you on both of those. Um, and yeah, the, the National League and the American League in baseball yeah. used to be two separate leagues. Now now it's one big happy family. Yeah. And, and yeah, even though, I mean, what makes Liv different is that they don't seem to care about the money. They're just they're throwing around billions. And, and that's what makes them so dangerous to the PGA Tour. I think money is eventually what's going to kind of bring this all together. Or I don't know if they eventually come together or what. It does feel hard to imagine right now because there's so much bad blood. I mean, <laughs> Liv just seems kind of happy to be here and saying, you know, <laughs> you, you can hate us or love us, whatever. We're just doing our thing. PGA Tour is, doesn't quite have that attitude. But, uh, you know, that's how it feels right now. Right now it's hot. It's wet clay. It's, it's changing. It's, and, and in a couple of years... Are they still going to be at each other's throats? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe there'll still be some amount of bad blood, but I think there'll be new people coming in who don't really have that history. The media deal will probably make a big difference, and I think the PGA Tour is eventually going to have to say, like, okay, we might not like these guys, but we got to figure out how we're going to live with them. No pun intended. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, thank you both so much. This has been great, and uh, join us next week. Thank you, Owen. It was great. Yep, thanks, Owen. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us for the very first episode of The Newsroom. So, so glad you tuned in. Please keep tuning in. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're getting this. Hit that subscribe button. We'll come at you every single Thursday. And our, our team, you know, we've got a really amazing team taking in all the big stories in sports and how it's touching business. It's touching culture. It's, it's touching the media in a huge way. And we'll be breaking that down and digesting it for you and talking to each other about all this stuff, as, as we love to do anyway. So love to have you along for the ride. Please tune in. Please subscribe and tell your friends. This is the very first episode, and we, we'd love to uh, bring this conversation to as many people as possible. We'll see you next week. <laughs>